This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, one of the resources that I use, um, several actually of the resources that I use in preparing for sermons, are podcasts. So they're audio. I don't have any video things that I look at, but they're audio. So you, you hear one person or a group of people talking about the scriptures. And the first one that I tuned into this week, um, the first thing out of the mouth of the first person to do the, to do the interpretation said, if you haven't made your vacation plans yet, maybe this is a good Sunday to go on vacation and have somebody else preach. Because let's face it, look at, look at all the lessons. We've got there in, in Hebrews something that without a lot of help is virtually unintelligible until you get to the last paragraph. Uh, we've got the reading from Jeremiah, which is a lot of finger shaking. And then you've got Jesus not acting like the Jesus everybody comes to church to see. You've got Jesus angry, seemingly angry at people. He's calling them hypocrites. And of course, Jesus never says anything bad to anybody, right? And in worst, he's stressed. I am so stressed with this that's coming, and I don't know what I'm going to do till it's accomplished. Can you imagine? I, I mean, it's almost like him being on Friends or something like that and saying, Folks, I'm really stressed out. You're going to need to give me some room. Um, that's not the Jesus we've come to expect. We come to expect the Jesus who's always got everything taken care of, and he doesn't even sweat when it's 110 out in the, in the heat. <clears throat> We expect a Jesus who doesn't actually have to deal with stress like we do. Is there anybody out here that doesn't deal with stress once in a while? I'm, I, just, I saw somebody wave in the back, but I, I'm not sure. <coughs> what, if, what if this was an opportunity to become reacquainted with kind of like the whole Jesus? Because by and large... People don't come to church, I don't think, to be yelled at. At least in, in the Episcopal Church, they don't. I think there's other denominations that are used to it. But in the Episcopal Church, often people describe coming to church because they've got stuff going on in their life that's really tough, and so they want to go someplace where they're going to feel better when they leave. I had somebody challenge me on that last night. The person came, and they were greeting me as they left, and they said, I want you to know, I come to church to be challenged. So never hesitate to challenge me. So I put his name on the list. <laughs> when anything comes up, uh, you know who's going to get the challenge. But, but the reality is, is that my hope is, is that at some level, we're kind of open to the idea that God is working with us. And sometimes that means pushing us into areas that we're uncomfortable, talking about things challenging us with things about which we just rather not talk. I think that this set of scriptures, particularly the gospel, is one that's very helpful there. Because it gets us the opportunity to be reacquainted with the fact that Jesus is in many ways not so different from us. Jesus experienced stress. He experienced anger. He was perplexed about people from time to time, and it was not sinful. Sometimes we often feel guilty for being anxious or being stressed or for feeling anger because that's not a Christian thing. We shouldn't have those. Well, when you see Jesus getting angry, of course, in the church, what we do is say, well, that wasn't anger. That was righteous indignation. <laughs> oh, well, righteous indignation is just anger writ large. Okay, Jesus was angry. But here's the secret. Jesus didn't live out of that anger. He didn't allow that anger to motivate all of his interactions with people. He didn't expect society to come and change itself because I'm angry today. He dealt with it. And there was a variety of ways that he dealt with it. First of all, he had the opportunity to have this great relationship with God, his Father, where he could take these things he had a group of disciples who were 
figuring out their way and learning on the path to being supportive of him. And those are the same kind of tools that we have when we have things that confront us, that challenge us, that make us angry, that make us anxious. But we live in a world right now that doesn't seem to be able to do that. Have any of you t turned on the news lately, whether it's radio, television, or read the newspaper, and see what's going on in Egypt? We've got two groups of people who are uh, murdering each other because they disagree about the way their country is supposed to move forward. I was listening to a speaker on, um, on NPR, and it was a fellow who was the former ambassador to both Egypt, and then he, and another time he was an ambassador to Israel. And he was talking about how disappointing the results of the Arab Spring have been throughout that world. And he says, at the heart of it, the problem is, is the people who are on opposite sides have so little trust in each other that they don't see any way to work together. Because the Muslim Brotherhood believes that the army is trying to wipe them out and destroy them. And the army believes that the Muslim Brotherhood is out to wipe them out and destroy them and take all the privileges that they had. And so there's no incentive for anybody to compromise on anything. And we see this repeated all over the place, don't we? Have you checked what's going on in Washington? <laughs> Have you checked about the divide down the aisle in our Congress? Do you expect that there is a great deal of trust between one side and the other? And as a result, they're at loggerheads and doing none of the work that we send them there to do. We see the same thing in city halls. And sometimes we even see the same thing in church and the way that church deals with making decisions. If there's two groups in a church that disagree about something, they choose up sides, and whoever has the most power wins, and the others leave quite often. Again, this has been going on for a long time, but it still happens in the church. I want to suggest that that's not necessarily what, in the church anyway, Jesus wants for us, and that there are other ways to go about it. If you're anxious, if you're angry, if there's an issue about which you are very passionate and which you know there are people who disagree, at some point each of us has to decide, well, what is actually the most important here? Is the most important thing here that everybody understand what I believe to be true and agree with me? Or is it that I be listened to and valued even in a community where there may be different points of view and different ways of looking at the same information. When it comes to the church, all of us need to be able to worship together even though we represent all sorts of different ways of doing things. So I think if Jesus' intention at the beginning of this lesson was to let us know that he didn't come to bring peace but division, he's successful. We live out a lot of that division. Because I think a lot of that division is about us being human and not necessarily taking Jesus up on the tools that he uses when he has to deal with his own stress, his own anger. Turning it over to God and trusting that God is there not just for me, but for all of us that it is not the most important that everybody see what I believe, value what I believe, and agree with it. Damn it. It is actually more important that I'm valued as a person who also values other people and other perspectives. And for us as a church, that we realize that when we come to the altar together, when we receive communion together, we are each receiving the body of Christ, and we are each receiving all the grace and love that God has to offer each of us and all of us. And that's, what's, that's why we're together here. So I want to point out something that has happened recently, and it's something you might decide, uh-oh, he's getting political. 
but I'm doing it because everybody is thinking about it and everybody is talking about it and it has to do with the recent changes that have allowed us to marry gay couples in the church. We have had changes in the state of California. The Supreme Court has ruled on changes and that's put us in the Episcopal Church in an interesting position because our prayer book doesn't provide for this. Our general convention has kind of figured out a way to provide for it. But do you realize this discussion and argument have been going on officially in the church for over 30 years? And we have done all sorts. I can tell you that our general convention has established a firm position at every single point around the possible points that there are on this issue. In the last 30 years, we've done that. But we've done something different in this diocese very recently that I thought was very important. Our diocese has people who, who are in congregations led by clergy who believe that this is actually the opposite of anything good that we ought to do. It is wrong. It is not what God wants of us. But they really want to be a part of this diocese. They believe that we're all called to serve Christ together here, even though we might disagree. So our bishop called together a task force, including actually somebody from this congregation. And instead of being a task force that gets all of the people with um, vested interests in the church together and then talks to the gay community about what they ought to do, it included people from the gay and lesbian community, people from the conservative parts of the church, people from just the general mainstream of the church. And they got together and say, how do we live together as a diocese when we actually might choose to do things differently? And they came up with a policy that made room for conservatives to follow their conscience and made room for other congregations able to um, lift up and acknowledge and bless the marriages of all the couples in their parish. And that group voted unanimously on the policy that allows room for each of the other parties. Now, I think that that is an amazing accomplishment. And I bring it up with that big issue only because everybody's thought about that. How many issues are there and how many places are there in our lives where we find ourselves overcome by anxiety and anger and we, re we somehow believe that there's no way for us to live together and be at peace with one another. All we see is division. I'd suggest that the message from Jesus, the experience that we have used in our diocese is you have to really want to listen. And I think that's probably the toughest thing of all. Um, I do some things in marriage preparation for all couples where we talk about active listening where one member one cup one member of the couple um, starts talking about something and the other one listens and attends to it and when they're done they have to tell back exactly what the other person said Do you know how difficult that is Do you know how difficult it is for couples to do especially couples that have known each other for a while and already know what the other one is saying and or thinking and so you're often very likely to get a response of kind of like from the, from the rack of all the things I expect you to say as opposed to what I was listening to. Well, we do that in all sorts of ways. Have you ever witnessed uh, a city council meeting or a discussion in our Congress where people get up and they make, they make positions and everybody else gets up and responds as if they'd listened to what was being said but they're really responding to something that was already written down before the other person spoke. In the personal interactions, in the relationships that we have, the idea of being able to listen to one another is absolutely critical. Second, being able to remember that we are actually all in this together. And God has called us to be together, to wrestle with all of these things, and God desires that we would show mutual respect to one another, even when we can't agree with each other. That we 
love one another and respect one another even while going our merry ways on all sorts of issues. Jesus talked about all of this in the very last part of his message today. He said, you all see, um, you all see the clouds forming and you say, it looks like it's going to rain. And it does. And you see the wind coming from the desert and you say, uh-oh, it's going to be a scorcher. And it is. And he said, you can interpret the signs of the earth and the sky. Why can't you figure out the present time? Because we don't listen. Because we don't pay attention, caring attention to one another. So I would suggest that Jesus invites us on this Sunday to not be comforted, but to be very uncomfortable so that we might pay attention, not just to the big picture things that are going on, but to the relationship things in our own circle of friends that we could make a difference on if we really saw the signs and interpreted them. I would invite you to think about that and perhaps even think about some place in your life where that might work for you. And if you feel like sharing it with me later, I'd love to hear about it. And that's what I did instead of rescheduling my vacation for this Sunday. Amen.